Hey everybody, thanks for watching this video. I'm Zach Peterson, I'm a technical consultant with Altium, and today we're gonna to talk about power delivery and we're gonna keep talking about power integrity as it relates to capacitor selection in your PCB. If you remember your Electronics 101 classes, capacitors basically store energy and they deliver that energy to your components in your PCB whenever your components are active. So whenever you've got a digital component that switches, it's not really pulling power from the power supply, it's actually pulling it from the capacitors on your board. You have to select those capacitors properly to ensure that you're always delivering stable DC voltage. As much as we'd like to think our power delivery network in a PCB is delivering stable DC voltage, it isn't actually doing that. So to see why, we'll look at some capacitor data sheets and we'll go over some of the points to look for in a data sheet when you're selecting capacitors. Let's get into it. So I wanna to return to this diagram that we were looking at in the last video and explain a little bit more about how we get these peaks in your power delivery network impedance spectrum. So just to quickly review, we have a, a, a voltage source here connected to our power delivery network that eventually outputs DC power to our components. Somewhere in here, we have some parasitics. Um, essentially, every connection and every conductor on your PCB has a little bit of DC resistance. It has some inductance. And then you've got your capacitors here, your decoupling caps that you put on the board along the way to producing a stable DC output. And ideally what you should have also is your plane layers, and especially if you're doing a high-speed design. Having a ground plane and a power plane right next to each other in your layer stack is really critical to ensuring that you provide stable power to your components even if you're just working with a moderately fast microcontroller because with today's logic in modern components, most components are actually running right at the border of high speed, even if you don't have something like a big FPGA or a CPU on the board. You're still uh, at risk of creating some of the power integrity problems that you see in a typical high speed PCB. So always include those plane layers in your uh, stack up. If you actually measure the voltage at these two terminals, and you look at it on a graph versus time, if you have a PDN that has impedance that matches the black curve, your uh, voltage output might look a little something like this. And it has this big wave here that occurs once a component switches and starts drawing power. Now, if you can get to the green curve in your PDN impedance spectrum, instead, you would, at least you would hope, that your uh, output voltage measured from these two terminals looks a little something more like this. There's always gonna be a little bit of noise on the DC output, but you would want it to be as small as possible. Now to do that, you have to, as I said, select the right set of capacitors and make sure that the capacitors that you select don't all, all combine in parallel to produce these big peaks. This begs the question, why would these capacitors produce these big peaks like this anyways? So let's look more at a capacitor circuit model and then we can actually see why this is the case. Okay, so now I wanna look at the actual uh, circuit model for an, a capacitor. And there is an equivalent circuit model that describes the electrical behavior of a capacitor. And that explains why you actually get some of those peaks in a PDN and impedance spectrum. So if you have a capacitor, and let's just say it's hooked up to some DC voltage, the circuit model is essentially just this. All right, here's my capacitor, wraps around to my uh, negative terminal on my DC source. Pretty simple, right? A real capacitor isn't just the capacitance. So here the capacitance uh, is formed just by the core dielectric, but there are two other elements that create uh, the equivalent electrical behavior that you see in a PDN impedance spectrum. So the first is you have some electrical leads that have some resistance. So every capacitor has some conductors that come off of the two plates that make up the capacitor. These lines have some DC resistance. And so we model that with just a resistor, value R. In addition to our capacitor, uh, those leads also have some inductance, which we also model as being in series with our R and C. And so all together in, in combination, uh, this circuit has a resonant frequency. So if R is small enough, you will actually have a situation where a capacitor will resonate, meaning it will hit a minimum value in its impedance. And so if I graph the impedance of my capacitor as a function of frequency, at low frequencies it drops just like you would expect for a typical capacitor. 
And then eventually it reaches this minimum. And this min minimum is your self-resonant frequency. And then after that, the inductive behavior takes over and the capacitance starts increasing again. So every capacitor has these equivalent properties and depending on the value of R, that will determine how sharp this transition is in this graph. Now, let's say I take two of these guys and I put them in parallel. What we would actually see in the impedance spectrum, I'm just gonna erase this just a bit. What we would actually see in the impedance spectrum is at some point, the two curves will intersect. And this point right here is exactly the type of peak that we have in our PDN impedance spectrum. These points where the two self-resonant frequencies are far apart from each other and the impedance curves overlap, that's what defines these peaks in the PDN impedance spectrum. And so if we wanted to eliminate this peak in the PDN impedance, we would just put another capacitor in parallel with these two. And if we have its self-resonance right here, then we would have a new curve that would do something like this. So instead of having a peak here, we would have two intersections over here and over here. And so this is how you get to a flatter impedance spectrum. And maybe not flat isn't the right word, but at least it's at a lower level. And so this is why in some high speed designs, um, especially designs that are using like an FPGA that has very many pins, like hundreds of pins, you might see uh, the design having like hundreds of capacitors in it. And the reason they do that is so that they can space out these self resonances in such a way that you get the impedance spectrum to be low enough that you are uh, not producing a very large uh, voltage fluctuation when the components start switching. So you have to add up all of these resonances in parallel in order to produce a really low impedance curve. So if you're an individual a designer, maybe you're just getting started on your first high speed design and you're not sure what, what impedances you should be using or sorry, what, uh, what capacitors you should be using and how their impedances pair up, you can always just do a really simple model just having this capacitor for a single capacitor uh, in parallel with a bunch of other capacitors. And you can do a simple spice simulation and you can look at what is the equivalent impedance spectrum of that arrangement. And that'll give you a rough estimate of what actually happens on the board when you put all those capacitors together to try and produce this low impedance spectrum. Because if you go back to your RLC uh, circuit theory and calculate what the self-resonant frequency you should be, you'll know that you need to know the value of L. So this is where we need to look at a capacitor data sheet and look at for some specific information in order to find out what these self-resonant frequencies are so we can try and select some capacitors to use in the design. Just so you know, you probably shouldn't follow the, the 20 year old or 30 year old guideline. I don't know when this, this thing started, but there's a certain guideline that says you should just use these three specific capacitors. I think the values are like 100 picofarads, one nanofarad and 10 nanofarads. That might be fine for designs that don't actually have any power integrity problems to begin with. Really, in modern designs, you need to have your plane pairs and then you'll probably have to have more than just those three capacitances. So let's look at some data sheets to see what information you need to look for in order to properly select capacitors to get to this lower PDN impedance spectrum. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is go on to Octopart and I'm gonna show you some uh, some data sheets for, uh, for an SMD capacitor. So just to start, let's do a little search for SMD capacitor and see what comes up. So obviously there's a lot of stuff here. Um, let's find a good one, let's find a good one. All right, this looks as good as any, so let's check out this guy. And what I wanna do is get into the data sheet. Uh, failed to load PDF, let's see. Oh, here we go. Okay, so we're in here. And um, typically what you wanna look for is either inductance. So you see there's several results here and you wanna see if you can find an inductance value. Because once you know the inductance value, you can actually calculate the impedance. Um, and it looks like I just scrolled past. 
Here we are, an impedance curve. So this is the type of thing you want to look for. You want to look for the impedance curve or you want to look for the inductance value directly. So here you can see on the screen, I've just found the impedance curve for 470 nanofarad uh, capacitors. Uh, and they've got several different models here uh, listed on the right side of the graph. So you can compare all these different models. And so what's important from looking at this graph is you can actually see where the self resonance frequency is for these different capacitors. Um, here for this blue curve, it's at right about 10, uh, 10 megahertz. Uh, here for the orange curve, it's, it's right about at 30 megahertz. And so this is a good way to, to pick out some different capacitors, is especially to overlay them like this. You can really see very clearly uh, where the curves start to intersect, and you can get a good idea of what your, uh, what your peak height might be when you start to select these different capacitors. So look at the scale here on the left side of the graph. You'll see this left side of the graph here gets down to the milliohm level. So we're at about 10 milliohms for, uh, for this, uh, this orange curve, this uh, 0306-8T-IDC uh, capacitor. Um, here, getting down to this level at about 30, uh, about 30 megahertz is pretty good for a larger capacitor. So this is where I think you start to get that myth of the three capacitors. It's where you look at these curves overlaid on each other and you can really see that for the smaller capacitors, uh, for a given inductance value, those dips in the impedance curve start to move to the right. So they start to move to larger frequencies. And just by combining like a you know 100 nanofarad, a 10 nanofarad, and a 1 nanofarad, or whatever you know cascading number of uh, capacitors you would uh, you would put onto a board, you can start to see where this myth starts to come from, and that it's always going to give you the, the the lowest PDN impedance. And the fact is, it doesn't. Um, you actually need more than just those three capacitors. So let's look. Uh, maybe at some other curves and see if we can see some differences. Uh, so just scrolling down here in the data sheet. Um, yeah, you can see some impedance characteristics for some of these other models. And a lot of companies, they will show this type of curve um, or they will give you an inductance value. So you can usually find the information you need, ju need uh, just by uh, doing control F inductance, control F impedance, uh, the other possible uh, term that they will use instead of just uh, inductance is ESL, or effective series inductance. Try searching for that, and you should zoom down to a specific spot in the data sheet, and that's what's going to give you the, uh, the information you need to calculate your self-resonance frequency. All right, everybody, thanks for watching. Give us a like, give us a subscribe, help us hack that YouTube algorithm, leave a comment, Anytime you want to see some uh, interesting PCB content on this channel, just leave it in the comments. We'll try and get to it. We get a lot of requests. And make sure that you look at the links in the description. There's some great information in there. If you are looking for a great PCB design program that you can use to build high speed boards, high frequency boards, power systems, anything you can imagine, go check out Altium Designer. It has all the tools you need to go directly from just an idea or concept all the way through schematic capture and layout and create your manufacturing files. It has everything you need and you can get a free trial for 15 days. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to call your fabricator.